Darn those meddling kids. Always foiling some poor guy's long thought out plan of scaring people away to either get rich quick, keep the land, or just score some really rad treasure. Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? was one of many teen-solving mystery shows, others such as The Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew, which were really popular during this time. Scooby-Doo, created by Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, aimed to be the first friendly cartoon for kids, given that Hanna-Barbera's other cartoons, such as Space Ghost, The Herculoids, and The Galaxy Trio, were deemed too violent by parents' protests. God damn those parents ruining everything. Those were pretty good cartoons as well. The original series, Scooby-Doo Where Are You, aired in the fall of 69, with 13 initial episodes, becoming an instant hit on Saturday mornings everywhere. The show was formulaic, with every episode beginning with the Scooby Gang arriving in a new town or city as being terrorized by some supernatural creature or being. Other times, the Scooby Gang got accidentally in the way of the villain's plan. Even if it was by accident, darn those meddling kids! The mysteries were no head scratchers, but it still beat the Hardy Boys somehow. And while the horror wasn't that bad, unless. You saw the episode with the creepy ghost clown, or the kooky space kook. That laugh still haunts my dreams. <laughs> and those two make me run away from a darkened stairwell or basement like there is no tomorrow. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but still an enjoyable show. And I became a fan of it when my mom used to babysit this kid, and that's all he ever watched, along with Spongebob. But some great episodes to highlight are... A gaggle of galloping ghosts, Night of Fright is no delight, and what the hex. Another nice touch were the title cards, especially for the first two episodes, given that the artwork was related to the current episode. However, the remaining episodes, maybe the animators got lazy or something, but they were just still images of the gang running away. You stack them all on top of each other, and you get a flip book of the gang running away from a monster. Which was pretty cool to see. Eventually, Scooby-Doo was repackaged in 1972 as the new Scooby-Doo movies along with a new theme song. The series was pretty much the same, except with the added twist of a celebrity guest star helping the gang solve the mystery of the week. Unfortunately, I had no idea who a majority of the guest stars were, so my favorite episodes were of the guest stars I did know, such as The Addams Family, The Harlem Globetrotters, Don Knotts, The Three Stooges, Batman and Robin, and Josie and the Pussycats. This series of Scooby-Doo became one of my favorites, and is also the one I would always look forward to watch. Also, due to the popularity of the Batman and Robin episodes, Hanna-Barbera decided to produce another show, which was The Super Friends. But, that's a story for another day. After Scooby-Doo movies, Scooby Jump Networks and moved on to ABC, with a new series titled The Scooby-Doo Show. The series was pretty much still the same, other than the network it aired on now, but it did introduce some pretty cool monsters such as Old Iron Face, who rode sharks, Jaguaro, a chimera of a monster, the Beast of the Bottomless Lake, who I believe was a nice tribute to the monster from the Black Lagoon, and the futuristic monster, who looked a lot like Zorak from Space Ghost. Wow, I haven't seen... Look away, Daphne. We all promised each other that we would never speak of him. Not ever. However, we all know good things must come to an end. And the biggest change in the Scooby-Doo series came when Scrappy-Doo was introduced in Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. Scooby's fearless and feisty nephew, always ready to fight the villain. Scrappy-Doo was okay at first, but eventually... He really did get very annoying. It's like, come on, either run away with the gang, or just stay there and fight the monster, or let him fight the monster. Scrappy did prove to be popular, but I'm guessing some people didn't like him because he single-handedly had Fred, Daphne, and Velma removed from the show after a year. And it was during this time that the concept of the monsters being real was introduced, such as the specials Scooby-Doo Meet the Boo Brothers, the Ghoul School, and, one of my favorites, The Reluctant Werewolf. The trend of Scooby, Shaggy, and Scrappy would continue into the next iteration of the franchise, which was The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. 
However, in this series, the show saw the return of Daphne, who is now a reporter, and also introduced new character Flimflam. Seriously, that's his name. Imagine what people say when they see his ID. Even worse, his parents, who named him Flimflam. They must really hate him. Fred and Velma are still MIA, but they do have small appearances in this series. And this series was a direct response to the movie Ghostbusters. Way to sell out, guys. The series did introduce another great character to the franchise, which was Vincent Van Gogh, a parody on Vincent Price, who was also voiced by Vincent Price himself, who had magical abilities and helped Scrooby and the gang capture the 13 ghosts. I don't know if they ever caught all 13 ghosts. There is no big finale or even a series finale. I believe the show may have just been cancelled. And in the final episode, the last ghost is still free. 13 Ghosts was very contemporary, with many pop culture references, fourth wall breaks, and Looney Tunes-esque gags, which was a staple for the next series. A pup named Scooby-Doo brought the whole gang back together for the first time in 11 years ever since Fred and Velma went missing, and this time as kids, and had a whole 1950s vibe to it. And they returned to a much lighter tone following 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. Also, it was following the trend of babyfying characters, such as Muppet Babies and Flintstone Kids, with the latter being another Hanna-Barbera production. The show is pretty self-aware, with many fourth wall breaks and the characters always looking into the camera, and with the gang being just parodies of their older selves. Except for Scooby and Shaggy, those two relatively remained unchanged, but Fred was now a conspiracy theorist, Daphne a rich vain girl, and Velma a shy prodigy child who only spoke when she discovered a clue or to solve the mystery. Red herring! Get on top of it, Freddy. He's not even in this episode! The series also introduced another new character, Red Herring, and, true to his name, he was always the Red Herring for the Scooby Gang, who Fred would always blame for the crime even after they solved it. He always believed that it was always Red Herring, and one time it actually was Red Herring, and it was also the one time Fred did not think it was him. Oh, the irony. The latter tone of the series even affected the monsters in the mysteries, with some of them happening even during the day, no longer exclusive to happening to the night which made it more creepy. And some of the monsters were straight up silly, like a giant pile of cheese, or a giant cheeseburger, or even Chickenstein, who was just a parody of Frankenstein, but now a chicken. Also, instead of the bubblegum pop of the 1970s, a pup named Scooby-Doo featured the 1950s rock and roll music, with dance montages happening during the chase sequences, with oftentimes the monster joining in on the dance only for the gang to pause and then run away from the monster and have the chase continue. With it being aimed towards a much younger audience, a pup named Scooby-Doo was much brighter and, as I said before, even had some events take place during the day in order to make it less creepy. And the sets had a much more wackier and comic style design. Some of the lines were not straight, objects were drawn out of proportion sometimes, and plus a lot of tile design as well that you would see in the 1950s. The art style even matched other Hanna-Barbera works, such as the Jetsons and the Flintstones, which you can see in the character models and also the features of the faces and hands. The gags in this cartoon were also very Looney Tunes-esque, with the eye popping or disguising themselves to confuse the monster, anything that you would see in a Bob Clampett or Tex Avery cartoon. The Scooby Gang would even tell the monster to wait until they can pick the right music for the chase sequence, and the chase sequence wouldn't continue until they had their music because who doesn't like a good chase sequence with music? Another Looney Tunes inspired gag was Scooby's nose. It would either pop right off by itself to sniff around for clues, or he could just take it off himself, which reminded me of Daffy's beak, which would either come right off from himself, or blast it right off from Elmer Fudd's shotgun blast. This series was also the only time that the gang were referred to as the Scooby-Doo Detective Agency, and also the only time that I ever see them get paid for their work. I guess that means before they did their mystery solving for free. 
a pup named Scooby-Doo was also the first time that Fred was not voiced by Megatron himself. And also the last time that Don Messick would voice Scooby-Doo, before he sadly passed away. And that would lead to as to why, after a pup named Scooby-Doo, there was no series or specials until 1998. They've unmasked over 200 criminals together. Consider it practice. In the world television premiere, it's Scooby-Doo and the gang in a brand new movie adventure. This time, the monsters are real. Cartoon Network's Cartoon Theater presents Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. I believe Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island saved the franchise. After so many years of not having any specials or new series, this brought life back to Scooby-Doo. One of the few dogs to come back from the dead. After seven years, Scooby-Doo returned with a feature-length film, and also began the era of direct-to-DVD films. The premise of Zombie Island is that, many years after the Scooby-Doo mystery gang split up, they reunite to solve one last real ghost mystery. And the big thing and the tagline for this movie is that, this time, the monsters are real. As a kid, I remember that Zombie Island got me heavily invested into the Scooby-Doo franchise. I wanted to know if the monsters were actually real, and what the mystery was. I felt the stakes were raised, and that the Scooby Gang was in real danger. Plus, we actually get to see characters die on screen, which never before happened in Scooby-Doo. Zombie Island is a great Scooby-Doo movie, and I recommend people to watch it if they want to get back into Scooby-Doo. And also made me look forward to the next Scooby-Doo film. Zombie Island, The Witch's Ghost, and The Cyber Chase are probably my favorite Scooby-Doo films overall. The Witch's Ghost gave us a pretty cool Stephen King parody, and also probably the best goth band you'll ever hear, The Hex Girls. I'd love the Cyber Chase, mostly because it was inspired not just by Tron, but also RPG games, which I'm a fan of. And the final level had a nice throwback to the classic Scooby-Doo cartoons. The later films returned to the old formula, with the monsters being villains in mask. I didn't like that they changed the concept, because the later films just felt like really longer episodes with improved animation. And I felt that the concepts of the monsters being real was better reserved for feature length films. Not that the movies weren't enjoyable, but the risk factor and the danger to the gang was eliminated once the villains started becoming people in mass. There are some films I did enjoy, such as The Monster of Loch Ness, Frank and Creepy was a nice callback to the original series, Moon Monster Madness, a funny parody of the Alien franchise, and Mask of the Blue Falcon to highlight a few. But because of the popularity of the films, Scooby-Doo returned to TV in 2002. A whole 11 years after the last series to air on TV. But this time, Scooby-Doo came with a catchy new theme song, sung by Simple Plan. Yeah, remember Simple Plan? They were a thing. Ah, uh, the 2000s. In fact, Simple Plan was really involved with Scooby-Doo. I mean, not like they got anything else to do, right? They even appeared in an episode. The new series was modernized and updated, while still keeping the Scooby-Doo formula. With the Mystery Machine now updated, having computers to help the gang solve the mysteries, and also including stuff like the internet, cell phones, and character designs were also updated with the biggest one having Fred no longer wear his ascot. In fact, the series as a whole got revamped, with the gags and sound effects also getting updates to reflect the modern times, with even the laugh track being removed from the series. The new mysteries also added to the Scooby-Doo lore, such as in the episode It's Mean, It's Green, It's the Mystery Machine, where the Mystery Machine comes to life and the Scooby-Doo gang has to find out why, leading them to the previous owners, the Mystery Kids. 
This episode is a nice callback to the early concept of Scooby-Doo, where the gang was supposed to be a traveling band and they were called the Mysteries 5. Of course all of that changed through development, but it was still nice of them to acknowledge the roots. Another one is Big Appetite and Little Tokyo, where Shaggy, after eating a mystical pizza, transforms into a kaiju and terrorizes Japan. I enjoyed this episode, it was a nice reference to the classic Godzilla films. After what's new Scooby-Doo came a dark time for Scooby and the gang. A very dark time. With Shaggy and Scooby get a clue. But we're just gonna skip right over that, mostly because I never watched it and it just didn't look good as well. Footprints, a werewolf costume, and bags of money. Hmm. After Shaggy and Scooby get a clue came perhaps the best iteration of Scooby Doo ever Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated. It had mystery, drama, romance, horror, everything. I loved this version, even the animation style. This series was also darker, not just style wise, but also the tone of the show. With the series now focused on an overarching storyline, as well as the monster of the week, the Scooby Gang tries to solve the mystery of Crystal Cove, as well as what happened to the original Mystery Incorporated team. Scooby Doo before has never really given me a scare or chills, but in this series, numerous episodes had me on the edge of my seat and also turning on the lights. The series also had some great references to previous versions of Scooby Doo shows as well as alluding to other characters of the Hanna-Barbera universe, and also some phenomenal episodes and storytelling as well, like Creeping Creatures and Fear of the Phantom, Mystery Solvers Club State Finals, which was a nice callback to the other Scooby-Doo copycat shows, Escape from Mystery Manor, another episode that draws from the movie Saw, and Night Fright. I really recommend checking this series out, and bittersweet, it ended after two seasons. Seems good mystery shows end after two seasons, am I right? But at least it ended on its own terms. It's also where romance between the mystery gang blossomed, with Fred and Daphne and Shaggy and Velma, which seemed right, at least for me. Scooby Doo, in my opinion, took a dive after this series with Be Cool Scooby Doo. And I mean, Scooby looks like he's been on drugs or something. And it never really interests me, so I won't really talk about it much, mostly because I've only watched two episodes of the first season. And the second season hasn't even aired in the US. The animation style even looks like they're trying to appeal to the viewers of Adventure Time and Regular Show, given that their style is very similar. Scooby Doo seems to be going strong, with the DVD sales keeping it afloat, and who knows what the next series will be. Hopefully something like Mystery Incorporated. The dog that keeps on leaving and has solved countless mysteries. Scooby Doo just seems like it will go on forever, maybe always being a reflection of the times. Thanks for watching Scooby Doo and Animation Retrospect. This is Geek Knight, signing off.